Um, again, just to kind of set the stage, uh, today's presentation is premium finance and really how to use it the right way. Um, our goal today more than anything is, like I said, to get a sense of how premium finance plays a role in your current practice, what we can do to help that, and really kind of get a lay of the land. Uh, Nicole's gonna introduce you to our Director of Premium Finance, Tim Whitmore, in a moment. Um, Nicole, are we ready to get going? Yeah, let's get started. So first, I just want to start off this morning with a polling question, a few questions, just three of them. So I'm going to launch that right now, just to get a, a feel of where you guys stand with premium finance. How knowledgeable are you in the space? Have you guys closed these types of deals before? So if you guys don't mind just answering those three questions quickly, I would appreciate it. Okay, a couple people. We've got like half of our results in right now, so I'll just give it another minute. All right, um, so we'll just get started here. So have you guys closed premium finance cases? It looks like about 23% of you have said yes, you have. And the majority, it's 77% have not. Um, so this is a great, um, we're really happy to have you here today. Um, and then in regards to if you've answered yes to the last question, do you regularly write premium finance cases? Uh, only 15% are saying yes, 23% uh, are saying no, and then the other 62 obviously were not applicable. Um, and last question is, if you have never closed a finance case, are you interested in adding it to your tool belt? And very excited to hear that you are all looking forward to hopefully closing some more finance deals and if you haven't, adding that to the tool belt. So um, awesome. Thank you for those responses. So about 12 years ago, I was actually introduced to Tim Whitmore, who's on our call today and who will be leading this um, conversation, so to say. And he was working for a premium, premium finance vendor at the time. Uh, we met in Vegas at that conference and just took a real liking for him. He's a great guy, super jovial, um, easy to get along with, and really, really knows his stuff. He's been in the industry for over 30 years now. He's worked both on the carrier level um, for multiple different carriers in their premium finance divisions. And then he's also worked at premium finance vendors. So he really knows both sides of the business, which I think is extremely important to know where kind of the carrier's opinions lie on certain issues and topics within finance business, and then also from the vendor's perspective as well, and representing the client. So with that being said, um, we brought him on to the Watermark team about a year and a half ago, just over that, and he's really been a huge piece of our most recent success um, in closing finance business. And in all honesty, I have done a few finance cases before meeting Tim in the past with different vendors and whatnot. But Tim has been a massive part um, of getting like multiple handfuls of finance deals closed for me in the last year. And so I just think that there's something huge to be said about that. He really breaks it down into such an easy language for both clients agents and us as marketing reps as well to understand. And so with that, I would like to introduce to you Tim Whitmore, who is our Director of Premium Finance. Good morning, everybody. So again, I appreciate you guys all taking the time this morning. And what we're going to do is, as Nicole said, I've been in the business a very long time and focused exclusively on premium financing now for about the last 20 years in various capacities. So Kind of seen it all, and we're going to talk about that today. John's going to lead us through a discussion of everything premium finance. So we want this to be interactive. Um, we're going to tell you, hey, where are the bad things out there? Where are the good things? And where does really premium financing fit in today's industry? Because today, uh, we're closing more premium financing business than I've done in my entire career. And there's various reasons for that. The low interest rate environment, the changes to the product, uh, the sunsetting of the estate exemptions, uh, all that plays into how clients are utilizing leverage to buy these policies for various different things. So, um, John, if you want to go ahead and get us started, and then we'll, we'll check off the list. 
Yeah, Tim kind of alludes to it. You know, everyone's talking right now about this low interest rate environment, low interest rate environment, but there's also kind of a perfect storm with, as Tim said, the, the sun setting of, of play, like there's so much as, as to why right now is the time. And so Tim, I'm curious, take us through maybe the last 10 or 15 years of premium finance and how you've seen things, especially emerge recently, because it, it really feels like we're kind of at a time where if people aren't taking advantage of it, eventually that's away. So, so how has it come to kind of all build to this point and where have you seen it grow in the last decade or so? Uh, yeah, as we both have said, it's changed a lot and <laughs> a lot for the better. So back, if you go back 15 years, kind of it was the wild, wild west days by Oli Stoli. And that's where if you Google premium financing, you'll see a lot of bad press. But you, if you fast forward today, um, the carriers, a lot of carriers force you to go through a approved vendor. So they've been vetted. We're actually vendors with several carriers. But what's different today is we've had a historically low interest rate environment now for going on 20 years, right? So that's nothing new. <clears throat> what's new is the product changes as well as some of the new programs that are coming out. So we're actually rolling out one here where traditionally premium financing has only been available to clients 5 million and above. Well, the new program is going to take that barrier down to call it about a million dollars as long as the client has some income. Um, so that opens up premium financing to a, a marketplace that is truly underserved in this in this industry. You know, and Nicole, you know, you talk about about adding Tim on, call it 15, 16 months ago. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the decision to, to bring Tim into the fold it wasn't just about you know knowing Tim for years. This was the time to kind of act on it. How? What have you seen leading up to the months before bringing Tim on that made it such an attractive you know proposal? Yeah, I mean, so often in the past before, I mean, I've known Tim actually as long as I've been in the business, but uh, just recently we're lucky enough to you know get him to join our team. But before working. Um, hand in hand with Tim, it was, we had worked with so many different vendors and not to bad talk any of them. They're just also different in their own ways. Um, and, you know, one pushes, one vendor pushes one agenda and another vendor pushes a different agenda. And ultimately yeah. it was really, I know what my agents are most comfortable, right? And I know what, I think I know because they, it, you know, explain it to me, but what their clients are comfortable with, the different risks and the pros and cons to these finance deals. And so understanding that and knowing my agents' personalities and their sales tactics and whatnot, it was, I knew that Tim would be, his personality and his knowledge of knowing both sides of the business would be so important and crucial. Um, and that's why we brought him on. And it, I will say it's so refreshing because, um, I feel like each marketing rep here at Watermark has, you know, their own style of doing business and they all work with different agents that have their own styles of doing business. And Tim's been really, um, what's the good word? Uh, he's able to like kind of camouflage himself well across different personality types and also just, you know, different ways of doing business and how to work with different agents and their clients' personalities. And so um, it's been huge for us in all honesty. And it's been really nice to, have the control of watching these deals get done also and knowing that everything's being done in an extremely transparent you know way and that it's all being done above board there's nothing you know that we can all sleep at night knowing that these cases are getting done in the right way and that there's no you know crazy amount of risk that it, and if there is risk that the clients know and that they're signing off that they understand all the risks involved up front so um, it's been really cool to watch it happen and kind of unfold here at Watermark. Yeah, and you know, you kind of um, alluded to a, a few of the issues that come about with premium finance, right? Um, the commissions are so high that a lot of people are incentivized to sell, yeah. sell, sell. And that's not, A, that's not how we think uh, life insurance should be sold. Um, you know, the, 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 the pressure, taxic, pressure tactics and, and things like that. But it's also, you know, this is a, Tim, Tim called it the wild, wild west a little while ago, right? So you're going to have people who bring pre-finance cases to you who are incentivized in a way and who might not have the partnerships and can't play the role that Tim plays. And I think, you know, having Tim kind of have a point as a point man, almost like at the eye of the storm, right? Knowing all the different angles, knowing the partnerships and the relationships that he needs to have, it really helps us, especially in the premium financing 
you know, sector be able to have honest, open conversations with agents and with clients. And we've really been talking about this for, for over a year now, the ideas of as Watermark Life as a BGA being not just a back office for agents, but really trying to help you conceptualize cases to help you find the right clients who might match the right case, uh, the, you know, the right uh, policies and the right products. And so, you know, Tim, one of the things that we really wanted to dive into is kind of like the good, the bad, and the ugly of premium finance. And, you know, we don't want to get too negative, right? Because I think we're all trying to, to learn how to do things the right way, but how are some of the, how has premium finance maybe been used the wrong way in the past and, and gotten, you know, uh, kind of the bad rap that it's gotten in some cases? And Tim, maybe take us through the good, the bad, and the ugly with it and, you know, how you try to avoid the ugly with it and sometimes the bad. John, it all comes down to how the case is designed and how it's presented to the client and their advisors. That's the bottom line. So I don't want to get on a soapbox, but I've seen a lot where they were designed incorrectly. And this isn't a case of, hey, there's, a, there's not a right way and a wrong way. There is a wrong way to do it. And yeah. some of the designs I've seen are no out of pocket, you know, and the client's rolling up interest and then they're taking out the loan and they're, they're illustrating it at maximum of AG49 rates. And they've got a fixed rate for two and a half percent for 15 years, which is unattainable. So, you know, uh, an attorney, and I've talk, uh, shared this with you, I put a, a policy in front of an attorney about 15 years ago down in Newport Beach. And I said, I call this the perpetual motion machine. And he looked at me and he said, you know what yeah. this means, John? This means ink can stick to paper. And I mm. said, I'm going to use that. So, and I have over the years, but it all comes down to design. So when we do a policy, we stress the interest rates, we stress the crediting rates. We, we view ourselves as consultants. So we educate the clients, whether it's an investment banker in New York or an attorney down in Newport Beach or a CPA in the country. Whenever we're talking to their advisors, we say, look, here, I network clients in general are not risk averse. They use leverage to, to amass their wealth. What they are is surprise averse. So if you detail and you go through, hey, this is what could happen. Here's your maximum collateral. Here's yeah. your borrowing rates. Here's what happened if interest rates increase. Here's what happens if the policy doesn't perform. If you educate the client on what those risks are, they can make an educated decision on whether they're willing to take those risks. And again, in my experience, the vast majority of them are. Because again, these are clients that understand wealth generation, they understand wealth transfer, and they understand leverage. If you have a client that has never borrowed money, then they're probably not a good premium financing candidate. And we'll talk about that later on. Yeah. Yeah. I actually think um, I just saw that David Lyons joined us. And I think he's probably the perfect person to call out and upon. So David and I have done business for, gosh, 12 years now over maybe. He is one of my better friends, uh, best friends in the business, I should say. Um, he's been with me from the very get-go of um, my insurance experience. But David has totally transformed his whole business this, this last year. And I, I do think it's in part to how him and Tim have learned to work together. And, and so David, if you could share a little bit about your experience with Tim and just going from having not done many or any finance cases to now having 10 in the hopper right now. Oh, you're on mute, you're on mute. All right, let's try that again. Um, <laughs> thanks, Nicole. Yes. Uh, I, I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to, um, to kind of chime in here and give you a little bit of sense of uh, where my thoughts are on premium finance. As Nicole mentioned, uh, I was probably most against premium finance for, for quite some time. I felt that the sale was um, cumbersome. I also felt it was very difficult for clients to understand. Um, and the process does take a few more steps. And so I was always concerned that if a client um, would qualify for regular insurance, and if for some reason there'd be snags in the, the finance component, that we would lose the whole case. And so I was already very, very tentative. Um, I finally dipped uh, my toes into water this past year, and I'm not looking back because <laughs> I, I feel that if the risks and everything are explained properly up front um, to everybody, and, and like Tim, I just caught the tail on what Tim said, it, it's not for everybody. And there's a reason why it's not for everybody. 
uh, because whether you don't qualify from an income standpoint or for a net worth standpoint or from a risk tolerance standpoint, that, as long as it's addressed up front, I think that that's okay for someone to say it's not for me. And along the way, and I've presented this to many, many of my clients uh, or prospects, and we've had quite a few that said, okay, thanks, but no thanks, which is okay. And maybe they'll come around um, months from now or years from now saying maybe this is the right time for them. And there are a variety of reasons why it may not make sense for them today. But the ones that we did get and in kind of in the pipeline, we've got a lot of them in the pipeline right now. Um, they're very excited about it. It's uh, something that they haven't seen before. Um, they may not have understood that this was even an option for them. If they're in businesses, whether they bought a business or if they're in the real estate business and they understand the power of leverage and they're comfortable with that risk, there's no reason why they shouldn't consider this as part of their portfolio when they're managing their risk when it comes to leverage. And, and, uh, and on paper, uh, all these numbers make a lot of sense as long as everything is explained. And you know, there are some market risk, there's some interest rate risk, uh, you know, we, we kind of mitigate those. Um, now that's speaking to the actual, a sort of client's perspective. I can tell you now from a producer's perspective, this, this team here is best in business. So obviously it's very easy for me to say my work with Nicole and her staff and her team because I've been working with them for a long time. So I know how they work on the, my traditional insurance clients. Obviously, considering I've been with them for so long and really don't work with anybody else, I can uh, testify to the fact of what they've ever done, what they've done for my practice. But when it comes to the financing, um, Tim, I've actually known by, who I've met years and years ago, but reputationally is the best in the business when it comes to the finance. So from a technical expertise, to be able to have someone like Tim and now people that Nicole are adding on. And there's, of course, there's everybody in the office there, John, there, Brad, and, and everybody else that's that's a part of the team, um, both consumer facing and back end. And it's a very, very solid team. But when you're actually getting down to into the weeds with a sort of A-type clients that are maybe bringing their advisors and there's some resistance, that's when this, this team is really going to excel and kind of drive uh, the point home for you in that technical expertise because Tim has basically fielded every single question. So he, with, his, with his knowledge, and so he's able to answer everything along the way. It, take, it took me a little while to get the speed, um, but then once you, it all clicks and then you kind of get it and you can kind of be very comfortable talking to your clients, kind of not having to bring in everybody every single moment. Um, you know, training wheels are off now. And uh, now I'm kind of doing these things myself, but then bringing in uh, everybody else when it gets to the finish line. You know, David, if, if we can steal you for, for one more quick question. You know, one of the, the concerns uh, that you expressed when we sat down and started working on your marketing materials was kind of promising clients the moon and then seeing chargebacks years later because they felt like they, they got duped. Um, can you talk about, you know, presenting to clients with, uh, a cautious approach and with kind of a conservative maybe pitch and trying to, to be honest at all times with them. Cause, cause you said it yourself, right? Like integrity there is really the biggest part of this, this, this piece. Um, and I'm curious how you've, you know, approached some of your clients who might be used to being promised the moon. Well, I think John, that does address, um, some of my initial hesitation all these years is because of having been in the business for 25 years and not have just come into the business where I said, okay, I'll sell this product and who really cares what happens 15, 20 years from now. I have a long-term sort of course that I'm sticking to and plan to stick to. So for me, uh, you know, I don't, I can't, it, this would be a disastrous situation if I felt that, okay, I'm not going to be any concerned about this in, in 10, 15 years from now. Um, I, I can't look, there are certain things we, I don't want to overpromise and and over and under deliver, but there are certain market conditions that do change over time. And I think that the ongoing service and the <clears throat> monitoring of the policies are just as crucial as to the initial sale of the policy. And so calling the client up year to year, asking him or her, do they understand what's going on? <clears throat> if there's a downturn in the market, that needs to be addressed. If there's an interest rate risk, 
that now is not either locked in or potentially looks like it's going to rise, then that has to be addressed. So I think as long as there's communication, I think that will um, Do we lose him? <laughs> David, thank you so much. Um, you know, our goal uh, with bringing David in today was really just to, to give you kind of the producer's perspective. Um, we're, we're so glad, uh, David, to, to see the success you've had with Premium Finance just over the last year and, and, and where it's going from here. Um, so we'll let you go whenever you have to go. We, we do appreciate your time, though. I'm actually um, going to put it out your way, so, yeah. Sounds well, good. we love you, David. Um, thank you. Thank you. You know, Tim, I, I want to kind of hammer home and really focus on the point about, um, you know, under-promising and over-delivering, right? And, and how we can illustrate a case. And so you have, uh, do you want to show us the case design and take us through that real quick so we can kind of understand, especially from the watermark vantage point, really, David kind of summed it up, right? These are long-term relationships and partnerships that we hope you're having with your clients that grow and evolve with them over the years. Uh, you know, the, the idea of set it and forget it, right? Selling someone a policy and then never seeing them again. That's not the goal with this business, right? Um, and so when, you, when you're when you honest with them and, and you show them the, the real picture that, and again, there are, you know, there are risks, but the real risks are involved. We believe that down the road, they'll believe you and trust you for that. So Tim, can you take us through this a little bit and give us a sense of, of what everyone's looking at? Sure, we'll walk through this, and uh, this is one of the many, many different strategies that we do utilize as premium financing for, and this is a case we recently closed. But, Sean, to your point, the annual reviews that we do with clients, I always view that as an opportunity, because to give you a prime example, exactly. I just did renewals on an executive case that I did with 10 executives, um, but the original case I did was on the CEO of the business. So then he said, I want to do a deferred plan for my execs. Can we do it? I said, yeah. And can we do one for my kids? And I said, sure. So we ended up doing policies on his kids, as executives, and we just did those renewals. But what happens is you have to deal with the CFO of the company. I'm dealing with the CEO. And then it's fresh in his mind. And he says, hey, I got a guy. I got, I got a random text a couple of weeks ago from a guy who said, hey, I know this client. And I'm selling my business. And he told me I need to meet him. So it gives you that opportunity to stay in front of those clients and they're fresh in your mind for when they come across additional referrals. Yeah. You know, I can't, you can't get a better referral than one from a client that you've done business with, in my opinion. And these clients are in the same circles. So obviously, extremely large company, a lot of, lot of income to be able to support 10 executives as kids and himself. So guess what? He hangs around with people like himself. So, you know, it's a great referral source. But here... Here's a case that we recently funded. Um, this was on a female age 46, just to kind of show you guys how we do it. This is one of five illustrations that we showed to the client. Um, but what this is, is they had an existing policy that they were funding and it was designed as an income play. So a lot of people think premium financing is only for death benefit plays, but that's not the case. About three quarters of what we're doing these days are income generations. Why? Um, there's some uncertainty on what future taxes are going to be. So to generate tax-free income, there's some uncertainty of the market. To have a 0% floor on policy, um, to have a death benefit, all of these things that come into play, having the rider so that you can have long-term care or critical illness, you know, kind of hits, checks off all those parts. So, and again, premium financing is just another way to pay for the policy. So in this case, they were paying out of pocket for a policy and they were gonna generate about $50,000 in, in income at age 60. So we said, let's take a look at it a different way. So what we ended up doing is 1035 in the policy, and you'll see in column one that there's 200,000 in, in year two, but there's 421 and some change in year one. Why is that? Because we 1035 the policy about $220,000. So by doing that and then funding at $200,000 for seven years, the client is paying the same out of pocket that they were paying on their existing policy, 28,000. We take out the loan in year 13. And then if you go over to column number nine, the income is more than doubled what they were projecting on their existing policy. Well, why is that? Because the bank is putting in more money. The client has, still has the same out of pocket that they were on their other policy. We're just utilizing that cash flow more efficiently. 
because of the 1035, you'll look in column number seven, cash value net alone, that's your collateral. So this client didn't have to post any collateral. The 1035 allowed the client to get into a transaction where it's financed, have the same cash flow, more than double the death benefit and more than double the income on the back end. Okay? That's why we do premium financing. Another thing we do too is look and we do other analysis and we say, what if the interest rates increase? This is one of those. If you look, we have a fixed rate here for the first five years at 350. This policy actually funded at 310. Okay, That interest rate can't change for five years, but we showed it at 40 basis points more. And then we show it on the increasing LIBOR after that. So we also show it at 200 basis points over. We're not gonna take the time today to run you through all of that, but we also show the policy returning 0% for the first three years. So these are some of the analysis that we do to say, look, even at 0%, you're not gonna have any collateral. And that was the case on, on this one. So even at doubling or 200 basis points over LIBOR on the borrowing rate, you're still gonna pull out more income than you are on your existing policy. This is the analysis that we go through. The other thing we said is, well, what if they just get into a new transaction, they keep their existing policy, we finance that, and then we use the cash value as collateral for the new loan. So these are all the things that we talked through with the client to see what the best outcome was. And in this case, 1035 in the money made more sense. Yeah, and what I think has always been cool and what I learned this last year was that life insurance cash value is um, valued at 100% dollar for dollar, basically, on the collateral, basically. So getting into a new policy, if your clients have cash values in current or in force life insurance policies, you can use that at collateral for the, uh, to collateralize a new finance deal dollar for dollar, where if you have like a brokerage statement or um, real estate, that's all valued the collateral as at a discount where life insurance cash value is valued dollar for dollar, which I thought was cool. Yeah. And that comes into play with a lot of the old whole life policies. So a lot of those were designed to endow. So you got that money sitting on the side and why not use that money to help you leverage and get in either more death benefit and or generate tax-free income. So the bank is gonna consider all cash value of policies, 100 cents on the dollar. So it's just like having cash sitting in your bank account, same thing. Yeah. If you look at this, I, I try to make things real simple with clients when I present to, I say, look, here are your risks. You got rising interest rate, which we talked about, we got policy non-performance, and then that that is the product of that would be potentially more collateral. So those are your three risks with premium financing. So, but at the end of the day, what's the benefit? So in this client, they're paying $28,000 in interest, so $280,000 over 10 years. If they live through life expectancy, which is that highlighted line there, they've pulled out $3 million in projected income. You have a $1.7 million death benefit still. So you put in 280, you get out 3 million in cash and you have 1.7. So if you just count the cash that they're pulling out, you've got a 10 plus X on your money. Is that worth it? Does that make sense? Yes or no? It's, it's really that simple. So, and again, and you know, we talk about, you know, Nicole and I joke, it's like leverage, right? People leverage everything. You know, one of the examples Nicole uses is, hey, does anyone pay cash for their cell phones these days? And it's, it's kind of interesting, but everyone does finance it. Why? You know, because they offer it and they offer it at 0% financing, whatever reason. But I have a better use for that $1,000 or whatever these phones are these days, right? You know, if I'm investing that money and earning 10% on my money, why would I use that to, to pay for a phone when I don't need to? Same concept here. If yeah. um, you, It's not just about the leverage between the interest rate and what you're earning on the policy. It's a leverage of what is your money worth to you as a client? You know, I've had clients that say, I don't get into deals unless I earn 25% on IRR. Why would you take money out of a business that's earning 25% to pay for a life insurance policy when you can borrow from a bank at something much less than 25%? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Tim, at the beginning of this, um, do, do you want to show anything more from the, uh, from the, the illustration? No, no. And, it, it, you know, this is an income generation. Um, we do do it for death benefit designs too. It works. Um, people ask what type of client. I've got clients that are six years old all the way up to 80 something. 
So anywhere in between, um, we have various different strategies. So we have that 1035 rescue. Um, we have a whole life policy converting. Uh, we've got um, buy cells, key mans, deferred comps, the state equalizations, the state planning plays. I mean, if anywhere you're faced with buying, buying a large life insurance policy, premium financing should be looked at at least as a potential for those types of cases. Because in a lot of times, to give you an example on buy man, uh, our key man and buy cells, what we've done, especially on buy cells, is we said, look, those are typically funded with term insurance, right? Well, why would you do that? Um, you know, unless you got an ROP term, you're throwing away your money. So let's look at putting a permanent policy in place using that same cash flow that you would pay for a term policy, using that as interest, financing a policy, and then turning on income on the back end. So you get cost recovery, you get supplemental tax-free retirement income, and you cover whatever the death benefit need is for the corp. In that case, it's a slam dunk. You know, you talk with the CFOs or the owner of the corporation, you say, look, here's a better way to do it. And you get cost recovery and you get tax-free income. You know, again, disclosing the risks, here are your risks, here's your reward. A lot of times it makes sense. Tim, can you kind of go into more detail about what type of clients um, this works best for? So, you know, age range, net worth, annual income, where's the sweet spot? Sure. As I mentioned earlier, we're rolling out a new program and that'll probably be you know, what would you say, Nicole, 30, 45 days away? Yeah. Yeah, realistically. Um, where your barrier of entry is going to be much lower than what you were on to trip, typical premium financing. When I first started out, it was 10 million and above clients. And then it dropped down to five and then dropped down to three, five. And But nowadays, like I said, if a client's worth a million dollars, they have substantial income, you can get into premium financing deal. So that lowers your barrier of entry to really almost any clients that you're dealing with, business owners, attorneys, doctors. Um, for the larger traditional financing, you're going to need a $5 million network. Um, and again, those, again, for estate planning, we we have a lot of opportunity around estate planning right now because people think that the exemptions are going to go away. So let's use those exemptions. Um, we've got a huge opportunity now for the income generation because of 7702. Uh, really, your sweet spot, though, is going to be anyone from 30 to call it 50 years old for the income generation. We can go up to age 60, but they just have to understand that income is going to be at 75. It's going to be a 15 time horizon for them. Um, but the sweet spot is really that 30 to 50 year old. And the reason I say that is those are typically the ones that have the income and have the network to support the face amounts because the clients have to qualify both on the life insurance side the justification of the face amount, and they have to qualify um, on the financial side as well for traditional financing. So, um, but, you know, we're seeing most of our cases, like I said, probably about 75, 80% are income generation, the other are death benefits. Yeah. And I think something that's really helped me out too, you guys, is whenever an agent comes to me and is asking for either buy, sell quotes, term quotes, you name it, I'm always now just without even them, just offering them for the same am amount out of pocket, right? So if let, let's just say the buy sell insurance costs ten thousand per insured per year, right? I'm now taking that ten thousand dollars, showing it as them paying the same amount, ten thousand into interest, and showing a premium finance deal, and I'm presenting that as well with the term quotes to the agent, and it's like, hey, this is a really compelling. Um, situation for the client to just consider and it just automatically opens up this conversation and makes them think hmm maybe this is a good idea and I have to say we've won a few cases it doesn't work every time and it doesn't always make the most sense either for the client but at least you're showing different options to the client that they may not have known even existed so I think that's really important um, and something that we would all love to help you try to get accomplished for you. Yeah, and I think what happens when you kind of present it that way, hey, did you know that this exists also? It To me, it makes clients ultimately feel like you are thinking for them, right? Thinking about them and for them, and you're caring about the decision that they make. I think Correct. one of the worst traps that life insurance people get is that we're just trying to get the product out, right? Whatever case, just, just get it closed. And when you can, you know, sort of uh, reveal that amount of, thinking that amount of strategy with a client, they're going to trust you long-term. And, and Tim alluded to something, it might've been David alluded to, uh, mentioned it earlier, the idea that 
your best referral is going to come from a happy client. Um, Nicole, just about you're, you're better than just about anyone I know uh, with building spheres of influence and with knowing how to find clients without coming off like you're trying to sell them something. Um, premium finance is one of those things that feels like if someone doesn't know about it, this, when they hear about it, they're kind of like, well, what's the catch? And then it's, well, how do I get in on this, right? It, it's, we're in a very kind of speculative GameStop, you know, uh, 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 market, right? Where no one wants to, to miss out on the boat. No one wants to feel like they don't have access to a way to make their money work for them. And so both to Nicole and Tim, how do you guys take premium finance and, you know, build it up from one person to the next and kind of, you know, build a sphere of influence or find yourself around people who might be, you might benefit from this. Cause I just think this is the kind of idea and strategy and product that once people hear about it, they're intrigued. Yeah. Sorry, Tim, I'll answer first. Uh, like I just said, you know, I'll always try to show the financed option versus the non-financed option. And then a second way is I always try when I'm out with friends, when I'm, you know, at the country club, when I'm just out and about, like having conversations with people, I always try to mention what I do and how I've helped someone recently, um, just to make conversation with people and keep things interesting. Interesting. So, um, a few times I have brought up like, yeah, it was really interesting. We just helped this business owner, you know, and I talk and I, I'll bring up finance within that. And they're like, wait, what's premium finance? And I'm like, you know, just the same way that you leverage dollars and money with your home on your home mortgage, we could do the same with life insurance. And it's like, you just like drop little tidbits and it yeah. feels, you'll see it. They start to turn and it's, you know, if you, you come from a place of education and how you want to help them and, hey, let me bring some new information to you and hopefully it can help you or your friends or your centers of influence, then I think it's, it's you know, that's keen to them. I mean, I don't, I don't, I just, it's, it keeps things interesting, new, and it's always helping them try to progress, you know, their business and their financial status as well, so. Yeah, and, and one of the things that we really champion at Watermark Life is always trying to provide value, right? Even if you're not going for a sale at that time, even if you're yeah. just setting the stage for something to come three years from now, right? Maybe you know that uh, a friend of yours just started a business and maybe it's not all the way there yet, but you're up, to, you, you know, you, you have faith in your friend or, or your family member and you say, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a heads up about this, but three or five years later is when we're really gonna talk and, and put this into action. Um, Tim, before we get into kind of some of the marketing uh, opportunities that we have around this with with Watermark Life and, and what we provide for you, I just want you to kind of sum up the client finding uh, experience for yourself. How do you find clients? How do you know who are the right clients for premium finance cases, and how do you do it kind of in a righteous way? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's that's the question, right? It's like, <laughs> how do I see more clients? How do I qualify more clients? And how do I end up doing more business at the end of the day? And, you know, John, through the centers of influence have been huge for me. I've developed those like Nicole has over the course of a career. Um, but how do you get there, right? Um, and like, like Nicole said, it's just having conversations. Um, you know, example I've shared is a, a couple of years ago, I was at the forum in um, Las Vegas, and I just happened to sit down at a table with a gentleman that was eating lunch and he was by himself and started to have a conversation. And he goes, oh, what do you do? What I did. And uh, he said, okay, let's have a conversation when I'm back home with my partner. So I was on a phone call with them and uh, said, here's what I do. Da, 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 da. Uh, and his partner said, okay, well, if we have any cases, we'll give you a call. And I said, well, let's spend a couple of minutes and I'll tell you about some cases I recently proposed. So I mentioned one case and his partner said, wait, we have a case just like that. Right. And that's how it started. Fast forward to today, a couple of years later, they're two of my best agents. Right. Because when they I asked him, what does he do? He said, I work exclusively with business owners. Right. That is the pool. But they weren't doing financing because they didn't understand where it was applicable. That's where the conversations come into, hey, this works for this. It works for this. And again, at the end of the day, it's just do I have a better use for the money? And can I leverage up the benefits by using financing? I understand the risks. I understand the rewards. So that's having conversations with centers of influence as well. One you know about recently is a friend of mine, Eric, 
who I've known again for, you know, 14 years. And Eric manages money it's for professional athletes. So over the years, Eric and I have talked and, you know, we, we became close friends and uh, we've done a couple of deals over the years. But um, what I did is I advised on one of the largest policies he ever did, right? I wasn't the agent. I didn't get paid on it. As a friend of Eric, I just advised him on what he should do, right? So guess what? Now, you know, because of the team here and because of the relationship, Eric has come on as someone that's going to do business with us regularly, yeah. okay? And what did he say when he was trying to develop his new centers of influence in Silicon Valley? What did he say his runway was? Two years, right? He doesn't expect yes. to get business for two years. But here's an example of someone I've worked on for 10 plus years. And Eric kind of joked and he said, Tim knows really knows the long game, right? <laughs> because along the way, it wasn't every week, every month, every six months, but you know, we go out and have beers at spring training, whatever it is. And you just develop those relationships, because yeah. those types of relationships, when you're, you're managing money for 300 plus professional athletes, those can be, you know, a potential just home run, uh, you know, please excuse the pun, but yeah. uh, it could be an absolute home run for you as, a, as an advisor if you get into those types of relationships. Um, joining other groups, I'm a member of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, although I'm not an attorney, I'm an honorary member because I go down there and I talk with the attorneys on how to do estate planning and how to do premium financing right. So they recognize that value and they say, oh, great, join, right? So those are the types of things that I do. And then again, client referrals. You don't ask the clients, hey, who else do you know? Um, my exec, again, who I did the 10, or his 10 execs, I always ask him, hey, who else is this a fit for, right? So that his wheels are constantly turning. He's busy, he's running a business. He's not out there farming for me, but when we do our renewals and when I do talk to him, I'm fresh in his mind. And he says, look, I got a buddy that's selling a business. I got another buddy over here. I got another buddy over here. So use those, uh, use those times as an opportunity for those referrals and see who else you, that they can uh, throw your way. Yeah. And, and one of the things that we really most of all wanted to convey today is the idea that you don't have to be an expert on this because we are. And you know, that's kind of our motto or that's something that we're trying to live by overall is the idea of partnering with you at the front so that you, know, you guys have the access and, and agents have the access to the, the end user, to the clients. And we don't, you, I want you just to feel like you have this kind of in your tool belt. And one of the ways that we're trying to really kind of not only convey uh, what we're doing, but, but also really make you feel like you have something to show a client is we built out these PowerPoint or this PowerPoint that will come up right here and go back to the front. So this is the, 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 the home page. We can easily put your personal logo or your company's logo in the top middle and down where it says Tim, Tim Whitmore, Director of Premium Finance. Above that, we'll put your name. You know, this is your show. Uh, Tim is along the ride to help in any way he can as we all are at Watermark Life. But we want you to feel emboldened to take this to your clients and feel like you can help walk them through this along with Tim. And so our big takeaway from this at the end of the day, you know, our call to action is if you have any clients who think you would benefit from even a presentation like this, a conversation with Tim, a conversation yourself, uh, you know, we would love for you to, Tim, did you ever create that Calendly link or can people just shoot you an email after this? They can just shoot me an email. Yeah, I do have okay. Calendly, but I haven't, haven't added it to my signature yet. Okay, so we'll put um, we'll put this in the chat function for you to know how to reach out to Tim and, and, and the rest of us at Watermark Life. But again, this presentation is something that we can co-brand with your name, with, with your representation. And if you want to take us through it, Nicole, this is a very thorough but digestible look at the risks involved, the benefits involved, the time that is going to go into this, right? Because um, as right. Tim I mean, said, and, and as, oh, go ahead, Nicole. No, it's just, I, all I wanted to say was that we put this presentation together specifically for one of our agents who was having a tough time understanding how to present 
all the different facets of a finance deal to his clients. And so he's like, I just want to be able to have it all right there in a presentation when I sit with them that lays out the whole lay of the, the lay of the land, basically. So you know, what's going to be, what is premium finance? Why is it used? How can you use it? And what is, in a death benefit or income generating scenarios? Um, and then what's expected if the client says, yes, this sounds great. Now what's expected from the client moving forward? And so that's, in essence, what we created that can be replicated out with your guys' names and logos on it. Um, and however you wanted to, you know, use or disperse this to your clients. But um, it walks clients and you guys as agents through like a sample income generation spreadsheet, right? And then it also goes through different accumulations and it goes through the death benefit for an estate planning case using finance. Um, and then obviously here it goes through how it works. Um, and then just little tidbits, important things to consider, right? Um, what can be used as collateral? Um, what are, you know, minimum net worths and um, annual incomes that clients need to have to qualify for these types of things? So I'm just going to quickly scroll through this, but we can send it, uh, a customized version to you guys. Um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out to either Tim or myself or John and how we can help um, create items to help, you know, sharpen your, your tools and make you stronger agents. Cause really that's what we're here for is to help educate you just to become stronger, you know, life insurance agents and advisors to your clients. So. Yeah. And um, you know, the, one of the, the bigger feel, fears that we hear from agents about premium financing is look, I don't deal with $10 million and up people. Um, and that's fine. You know, that's everyone has their, their clientele. I think the key going forward is knowing that there are other products, uh, you know, in place now and, and, you know, from Watermark on the way where, where we're going to be able to open this up to your entire client book, as David, as Tim said, you know, doctors, uh, attorneys, everyone in your, in your social circle can benefit from something like this. So, um, Tim, Nicole, I think we're just kind of uh, at, the, at the end of this. Does anyone have any questions that they want to specifically ask Tim right now um, that can help kind of bring you any value right now? Or as Tim said, you can reach out to him at tim at watermarklife.com. I'll drop that in the chat and you'll know how to reach out to him directly. And, and I'll put in my email and Nicole's as well. If, if this uh, PowerPoint presentation is something that you think you value and your clients value, we would love to help take you through it and then either design it as you want to see fit, put your name on it, whatever. We can literally just uh, put your name on it and go if, if you're happy with it. But the idea is let's own up uh, premium finance to your clients. Let's, let's you know, use this as your tool. But um, were there any questions? If you want to ask anything, you can drop it into the chat or just raise your hand. And John, I, I want to let everyone know. People always ask, well, how do I talk to clients about this? Simple way I do it is I say, look, I've got a unique strategy that generates tax-free income by using other people's money. It's just as simple as that, you know, and you, you can tailor that to whoever client you're talking to. If it's a surgeon, look, I've got a unique strategy that we utilize with doctors that allows you to generate tax-free income with limited market risk by using somebody else's money, right? And the good news is, if you're talking to somebody that's not an uber wealthy client, you could say, and the great news is, there are programs out there now. This has historically been reserved for ultra wealthy clients, but now we have access to programs. So you can have that same strategy and utilize that strategy. Yeah, yeah. So um, to kind of wrap this up, again, thank you everyone for your participation. Uh, we are so excited to, to have you every time that we put one of these on. Next month, we're putting on estate planning in today's day and age with uh, an estate planning attorney, Brian Standing. Um, Nicole, can you talk us, to, tell us a little bit about Brian and, and what he's going to kind of explain next month? Yeah, Brian is a really good friend of mine and someone who's absolutely brilliant when it comes to estate planning. And um, he, anyways, uh, he is going to be sharing with us the different types of, you know, trust and how to properly estate plan and put together financial plans and make sure that they're owned correctly and whatnot. He's 
deep into a few different areas. It will be very interesting and um, we'll be working on getting that information out to you shortly, so. Yeah, and I think the, the biggest takeaway from that and kind of as Tim said, right, the time is now. Um, there's a confluence of events. Uh, of events. I, I like to think that the time is always to have these conversations and to discuss how estate planning uh, figures into life insurance and your practice, but especially now, um, new presidential regime, new tax, all these things coming up in, in the near future, if not already here, uh, 7702. I mean, there are so many things going on right now where just providing you some more of that education and information uh, should be really important and really valuable. Again, in the chat function, I dropped in Tim's email address, my email address. I'll, I'll put in Nicole's as well. Um, reach out to us at any time. If this is something that you think can really bring you know, a change to your business, truly get on the phone with Tim because uh, as David kind of shared, we're seeing instant results from this kind of stuff. So um, again, thank you so much for your time. Invitations are gonna start going out for our next presentation later in this week. And we hope to have you join us then. Yep. Thanks everyone, really appreciate it. Thank you guys. A great day. Thanks guys, Thanks, everyone. thank you so much. Of course, thank you. Appreciate it guys, appreciate it, thank you. Thanks.